This is Kenya's Amboseli National Park. To the local Maasai tribe, this is a place of water, its green pastures nurtured by the melting snows of Mount Kilimanjaro. For the elephants, Amboseli is a special place, a safe place in an increasingly hostile world. Amboseli was Dr. Joyce Poole's laboratory. Here she spent most of her adult life learning the ins and outs of elephant society. Now she's come back to protect these herds. Without such help, these elephants could well become a mere memory. The African elephant is the largest, most powerful land mammal in the world, and one of the most vulnerable. From the time of the great hairy mammoth and beyond, elephants and countless long-lost ancestors have roamed the earth for a respectable 55 million years. Now but two species remain, one African, big and wild, one Asian, smaller and more often domesticated. Despite their gangling outward appearance, elephants are not dissimilar to humans. They're bright, they've roughly the same lifespan, and they spend their lives in extended families. Joyce Poole also credits them with having emotions. Elephants are actually really special. I mean, they, they are highly in intelligent animals. They live in a very complex society. Um, from my observations in Amboseli, they have, for example, an understanding of death. They, uh, they do grieve when they lose a member of their family. Um, I believe they have a sense of humor. Um, I believe they're self-aware. Elephants live in what we call family units, and a family unit is made up of several usually related adult females and their immature offspring. The average family size in Amseli is around 15 and each family is led by usually the oldest female, who is known as the matriarch. The matriarch probably makes most of the decisions. Uh, for instance, where to go, how to react to events in the elephant's lives. I mean, she's not sort of an authoritarian. And I think she rules more through respect. Nearly 1,000 elephants still call Amboseli home, and the families, by and large, have remained intact. For the past 25 years, their way of life has been protected by Joyce Poole's mentor, Cynthia Moss, and her Amboseli Elephant Project. I came down to work with Cynthia first in September 1975. At that time, I was only 19, and uh, Cynthia, in fact, was working part-time for my father at the African Wildlife Foundation. She gave me the task of getting to know the male elephants because she was more interested in the females and families. Joyce loved the work and was quickly on first-name terms with the different adult males. She took photographs, made detailed drawings, and generally made their private lives her personal business. While young females stay with their mothers for their whole life, uh, males leave their families, leave their mothers, when they're about 14, 15 years old. Once a male has reached about 25 years old, he begins to show a very clear pattern of sexual activity and inactivity. After I'd been in Amboseli for a few months, I noticed that some of the big males were dribbling urine continuously, and uh, they had very swollen temporal glands with secretion. And we worried that maybe it was some kind of a disease that was spreading through the, the male population. But then it was a couple of years later, I was given a paper on must in Asian elephants. And must is a, a form of intense sexual and aggressive activity. And uh, everyone had said must didn't occur in African elephants. But when I read the paper and looked at the pictures that were in the paper, I realized that that's what we were observing in African elephants. Joyce is returning once again to Amboseli to look up some old animal friends and to continue her research into elephant communication. Elephants have a reputation for having very good memories and from my own experience, 
I've noticed that the elephants remember me, even though I've been away for quite a long time from Amatoli. Hello, Barbara. Hello, girl. Barbara, an old friend, seems to recognize Joyce, as does another old pal, Bonnie. So maybe it is true, elephants never forget. Hi, Bonnie. Meanwhile, someone very large and full of his own importance looks like he has an old bone to pick with Ms. Poole. This guy is blocking the road on purpose. He's doing the must mail thing, just silently towering over vehicles. Must males like to do this. Block tourist traffic. There we go. Thank you. Unimpeded, Joyce continues to the far side of the central swamp to see how one of her favorite old groups has fared since the recent death of its matriarch. Finally, Joyce locates the family she's looking for. You see this little tuskless female here with the big male behind her. Her name is Tulip. She's 14 years old, and she was orphaned recently, orphaned as a young mother. There's a one-year-old calf following Tulip, and nobody knows where this baby's come from. It's obviously not in very good health. This little female on the right here with no tail is called Tailless, and this is Tulip's young daughter. Tulip, only 14 years old, is taking care of three babies, two of whom are not her own. It just shows the kind of compassion, the kind of empathy that exists in elephant families. The old matriarch, who had died leaving Tulip and a sister orphaned, had been called Tuskless, and a great favorite of both Joyce and Cynthia. Tuskless's home range bordered Cynthia and Joyce's camp, and every day the elephant family would wander by to say hello. But recently, the friendship had a tragic ending. Last year, Tuskless was shot and killed in what turned out to be a case of mistaken identity. Tuskless was shot last year by Kenya Wildlife Service, apparently by mistake. An elephant had killed a cow, and in trying to appease the Maasai, they decided to shoot an elephant, and they shot the wrong elephant. The death of a matriarch is like a single parent family losing mom. Young elephants stay with their mother almost the same length of time as humans, and when the family loses its leader, the offspring lose the opportunity to acquire survival skills that are normally passed from mother to child. When a matriarch dies, you really see how important her leadership was. Because in cases in Amboseli where a, a matriarch, a strong matriarch has died, very often the family splits up. The matriarch is kind of the, the glue that keeps everybody together. Tulip, Tony and Tilly are the three eldest females of Tusklessy's old group. Who will take over as the new matriarch isn't yet certain. Yet, following her mother's death, Tulip, already with a daughter of her own, has taken her little sister under her wing, as well as the tiny, unrelated orphan. To survive, the little orphan will have to depend on Tulip to be his wet nurse. But that might not be quite so convenient. Spring is in the air, and Tulip, it seems, is in danger of being led astray by a group of males who have something else in mind. Tulip's suitor is determined to get her on her own, but he hasn't counted on Tulip's orphan, Shadow. And when two other bull elephants want to join the fun, things look a little scary for the youngster. She's moving away from them in a way that suggests to me that it's her first day of estrus. 
and this might make it very difficult for that little baby to survive because usually what happens is the youngsters run along after their mothers but they're usually a bit stronger and I just don't know what will happen to this baby. A female generally will come into season and breed only once every four years. The mating preamble of African elephants is not something you'd particularly want to get in the way of. There's a lot of snuffling, poking and rumbling while the males decide whether today is their lucky day or not. But this suitor seems to think that Tulip is indeed almost ready to mate. A female will usually be escorted by one or more must males as she comes into full season. They'll keep other bulls away, and when she's ready, the highest ranking male will be the one who mates with her. In her earlier research, Joyce realized that bull elephants announced that they were in must with a very low frequency rumble that sounds more like a grunt of indigestion than an expression of desire. The must rumble is very much, it is I who is rumbling. <laughs> I am in must now and I am over here and I'm in peak condition. By coming into must, and having very high testosterone levels is a statement that I am going all out, watch out. The huge difference in terms of the numbers of vocalizations used and the frequency of vocalization between the two sexes. And I suppose male society is very much about me, whereas female society is very much about us. In studying the male's must rumble, Joyce felt that she was only hearing a fraction of their calls. Joyce suspected that they were making many rumbles which were inaudible to the human ear. She spent several months recording these rumbles with infrasonic microphones and then analyzing them. She soon realized that the human ear was only picking up about one third of all the animal's vocalizations. I think that what is unusual about elephant vocal communication is just the variety and the number of different calls that are used and I think it's quite unusual in the animal kingdom. They make close to 20 different low, very low frequency sounds called rumbles. There's a let's go rumble and a, a post copulatory rumble and a lost rumble, contact rumbles and so on. Even as Tulip is being courted by the big males, we see the tiny orphan being kept out of harm's way by two of the group's six-year-old females. Look how they've gathered round the baby, touching it and reassuring it. It's really interesting, the difference in behavior between young males and young females. The young males are much more likely to go off and play fight, whereas young females start taking care of babies from the age of about four. Play fighting is not just a frivolous activity of young males. It prepares them for the time when they'll have to challenge or be challenged for the right to pass on their genes to the next generation. And the tussles also hone the young males' fighting skills so they can protect themselves against predators. The main weapons in the elephant's armory are their tusks and agile, multi-purpose trunks. The trunk is just an amazing appendage because elephants use it for so many different things. It's estimated that there are some 150,000 muscle units in the trunk. They use their trunks to caress one another to smell, to dust, to mud splash, to drink, to eat. Um, no, it's incredible. One thing both sexes share is that they like to play. There's nothing quite like a good wallow, and Ambicelli surely must rank as mud bath heaven.
But far beyond the tranquil, protected water holes of Amboseli, there's a threat that unstopped could devastate every herd of elephants in the continent of Africa. During the late 1980s, three to 5,000 elephants were being lost to the poacher's gun in Kenya, all for their ivory. Despite making exciting new discoveries in her research at Amboseli, Joyce Poole felt that she couldn't remain holed up here in this sanctuary while such a slaughter was taking place. In the late 1960s, mid-1970s, Kenya's elephant population was about 165,000. By 1989, there were probably about 20,000 elephants remaining, and that was almost entirely poaching. It just seemed that the more I learned about the elephants and how fascinating they, they are, the faster they were dying. And uh, I felt I needed to, to do something about it, to work with the other people trying to stop the uh, ivory trade um, and to reach the world. In 1990, Joyce began working with Dr. Richard Leakey, the new head of the Kenya Wildlife Service. Leakey was a man with a mission. With his controversial shoot-to-kill policy, Leakey declared an all-out war against poaching. Leakey then made history when he persuaded Kenya's President Moy to set fire to the 12 tons of ivory that his government had confiscated from poachers and was intending to sell. With this dramatic gesture, Leakey sent a message to the world that ivory should not be for sale under any circumstances. We believe unless the ivory trade is stopped, the African elephant will go extinct. Joyce worked with the Tanzanian government to draft an international treaty that in 1990 would finally be successful around the globe in banning the trade in ivory. So I then left Amboseli and worked for four years at Kenya Wildlife Service um, in charge of the management and conservation of Kenya's elephants. I found the job very exciting in many ways. I really enjoyed the chance to bring in some young Kenyans, give them a chance to work with elephants and pass on my enthusiasm to them. With the passing of the international ban on ivory products and Leakey's hard line, the elephants began to stand a chance. By 1993, Kenya was losing fewer than 50 elephants a year to poaching. So once the ivory trade ban came into effect and poaching was under control, the elephants started slowly moving back out to areas they had once inhabited, and then they started coming into conflict with people. How were we going to cope with the conflict between small-scale farmers and this onslaught of elephants coming in every night to their farms, to their shambas, and destroying their livelihood. I was in a position where I had to decide which elephants had to be shot, for example, um, when there came conflict between humans and elephants. Um, so yeah, I was under, I had to make a lot of very difficult decisions. Finally, in 1993, Joyce left the Kenya Wildlife Service to return to her research. The whole reason I left research in the first place was because I felt, oh, we're learning so much about these animals, and yet people are out there killing them. I've got to do something. I've got to stop it. And now I feel where I can do most is to go back to bringing out those special qualities of elephants. Nineteen ninety-seven was a bad year for the African elephant. Conservationists were outraged when the world body responsible for protecting endangered animals voted to let three African countries resume selling ivory. I think that it could very quickly go bad again. The reason that the ban worked was not the ban in itself, but was public awareness. People began to realize what buying ivory was doing to elephants in Africa. And what frightens me about the ban being overturned 
again, is not just that the trade is open, but what message it's sent out. It's okay to buy ivory, and that's simply not the case. Amboseli National Park has always been one of the safest places for elephants in Kenya. But how long it can stay that way is uncertain. There's continuous pressure to turn land over to farming and to allow grazing. It's a worldwide theme that plays again and again. The neighboring Maasai often run their cattle through the park, close to the grazing elephant herds. It's a recipe for potential disaster, like the one that claimed Tusklis's life and thrust such responsibility onto 14-year-old Tulip, who's still a mere adolescent. And yet, as nature will have it, Tulip is ready to do her bit to ensure the survival of the species, while tiny Shadow the orphan toddles round her surrogate mum. The next morning, with her family watching in vociferous excitement, the same must bull finally mates with Tulip. Somewhat unimpressed, Shadow the orphan trots after Tulip. Shadow's tenacity pays off, and finally the little tyke is allowed to suckle. Now there's hope that he'll manage to pull through. This behavior, which Joyce translates as compassion, confirms her stand that the elephant is without doubt a very special creature that deserves very special protection. I think that there are a lot of things we could learn from elephants in terms of their, their sense of family, their compassion. They're just very loving, warm, sensual creatures. I think humans care more if they believe that other species are like us. They deserve more rights if they're like us, because we have feelings, we have minds. We're so used to thinking of ourselves as being the only mind-havers. But now we're beginning to recognize that other animals do have minds, that other animals do have feelings about, about things. And I feel, gosh, there should be just some place that's there for elephants, that's there for other creatures that we share the earth with. But that means a lot of sacrifice on our part. And are we prepared to do that? Mm -hmm.